He's gone again. Sorry, are you talking to me? What's your question? <laughs> yeah. Talking to me? You're talking to me? <laughs> so I just asked you about... Um... <laughs> I was zoned out thinking about my doubles list for bloody articles. Yeah. Hello and welcome to the Hobby Breakfast Show, kicking off your mornings with miniature wargaming chat. Your hosts this morning are me, on odds we also have grow of the finest pipe breeds in all of the south farthing old toby good morning and also a very special guest drum roll please one of the the top 20 middle earth trashy battle game players in the world it's the mayor as of this weekend thank you very much good morning good morning yes in today's show then i mean you might have already uh, got a glimpse there from the, the rapturous applause for the mayor there that we are going to be talking about Articon and uh, your experience there. Before we do that, though, we'll be running through some of the news and having a bit of a hobby chat. Stay tuned. Right, so this week, what have we been up to? hobby wise i'm guessing mayor you didn't really have enough time to do anything hobby wise being at articon well four out of the seven days uh, last week was spent at articon so uh yeah. that'll have to be my hobby for the week i'm afraid a, a, a grueling experience good hobby to be fair but we'll, we'll get on to that as a topic all of its own ot what have you been up to this week well i finally got around to actually painting some of my not hundreds, but tons of Angmar models that I've had sitting around for ages. Um, so I've uh, painted Birda, and then yesterday I painted three of my um, Dead Marsh Spectres. I've also um, primed some of my Barrow Whites, and I've started assembling some of my Orcs, but that's going to take a while because I'm quite lazy. You've got over 30, I think, don't you? I do, I do. I've painted yeah. two. I've got 38 left to go. Um, so, okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's yeah. manageable. Uh, when are you planning of... to buy Gulliver? Um, well, I, controversially, my list doesn't have him in. Um, mm. But I don't Ooh. know. He did, did have even... a change in the FAQ, didn't he? I haven't actually... I can't remember oh, what it was. He, 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 did have a change. he did have something. I can't remember what it was either, but I remember... I think it was to do with this courage because it's always the same mm. as wounds. Um, I'd have to check that. Well, there we go. I, I look forward to in two weeks' time hearing you finish the orcs with your painting speed. <laughs> but yeah, we'll quantity see. over quality. Speed is key. yeah. Speed speed is key. And what have I? I have been painting more burrows and badgers, which <laughs> I'm sure everyone will be interested to hear. I, I'm been painting very slowly but consistently i painted another two two models this week it's just nice to you know actually spend a bit of time on each one and not not have to rush them like i feel like i i have been with the orcs that i was painting in the month prior so i've painted up this little dog a, a corgi dressed as a me medieval knight which was quite cool and then i've also been painting up Little otter as well, and they're the two leaders of my war bands. In have you seen the otter? Yet? No, I haven't yet shared an image of the otter. Mm. I, I will do so and it's be done. Its base is still drying to be fair. I just finished basing it today, so I think the frog is still my favorite. The frog, the frog, I think probably is my favorite. Well, I do quite like the little. Corgi Knight, actually. The Corgi Knight might be might be my favourite one to paint so far. But anyway, I've got plenty plenty more to go. Slowly get my way through. I say plenty more. It's about five more, because you don't actually need that many models for the game. But there you go. And once I'm, once I'm done with them, I'm not sure what I'll be on to. Something new, probably. For listeners, they are um, humanoid uh, animals. They're not, mm. they're not on all fours. Yeah, it's, it's not like a little corgi that's been dressed up in one of those kind of coats they get put in at winter with, like, <laughs> a sword. <laughs> trap know, in it just you could do a, like, like one people. of those in battle armour. You could like, do. Put, like, spikes all over it. 
Yeah, I I don't quite think it would work with with what the game's going for. Okay. Yeah, no, it's it's a corgi stood up, shield in one hand, mace in the other, in like full plate armor. It's pretty cool. It's a really nice model to paint. I found all of them really fun to paint actually. I think it might be because I'm not having to paint like skin. I'm not a mm. massive fan of painting skin. I think the um like hair is easier to get the highlights on but also but anyway with the, with the way the game is structured like you've made it sound like much more of a skirmishing game with lower model count so like you can afford to spend i mean yeah if we're, con if we're contrasting what we're talking about in terms of like i'm gonna have to pay 38 orcs and you're gonna have to pay what eight nine models for your whole army or whatever like less than that just, i mean yeah. one one of my warbands has six in and then one is a bit more lean only has or and it's, it's interesting isn't it because i think we we often refer to middle earth as a skirmish game mm. but it, it's almost in middle ground because i mean yeah. when when mayor plays kill team you'll only have about 10 models running around won't you yeah 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 so it's kind of like a, a different league isn't it you have the very small games you have the kind of middling games like middle earth and then you have the the bigger games which yep. are just too too much painting. Green I tide in forty k. <laughs> the the issue is I just get bored half through the project and it wouldn't get finished. Yeah, like mm. with any of my projects. That's why you love Blood Bowl so much. That's why I love Blood Bowl so much. It's also why I love eBay. But anyway, <laughs> moving moving on swiftly to the news. Not too much to get through. A couple of things that have caught our attention. Um, the elves, which were only revealed in the week prior to this one, uh, some of them have already been released by Forge World. So you can get your hands on Glorfindel, the uh, the guards of Lothlorien with the pikes, and was there someone else? Uh, Rumor that there was. was. That, that's it. I, I almost feel like they were released like months ago. They were announced so a while ago because they were in. They're announced, um, yeah. Orofin was in Defense of the North, wasn't he? Mm. Yeah, I think he was. So, yeah, yeah. you're right. So, um, so they've all come out. So that's good. I, have you guys checked out the um, little spinny 3D view of any of them? No. Um, I've got them on screen now. They look. There we go. Wow, that is pretty fancy. I think Glor Glorfindel lives up to the hype, is what I'm going to say. Mm. So it's eight pounds, yeah. not expensive, but for the points you get, he's not unreasonably yeah. expensive, I'd say, because he is quite an, a, a pricey model. So yeah. he, it's not Guards like you're the, buying. Guards of the Galdrim Court are 23 quid for three. Yeah, the, those are maybe slightly. Yeah, I know no, I've I heard really people. Like the models. <laughs> yeah, I know I've heard people say that the previous ones had been moved to fine cast, and that the pikes were basically impossible to get in a straight line. Yeah, but for the the basic shoots in Forge World, where they're kind of giving you three for over twenty pounds, is yeah. very expensive. Yeah. So. Mm. And then the other little little bit of news, not Middle Earth related. But uh, a game which I, I'm interested in, and I've been working on getting you two it's interested forcing in. Forcing us to buy miniatures. <laughs> yeah. To add to our shame. <laughs> it, it didn't take a lot of persuasion. It took about, I'd say, 15 minutes of messaging before I basically got you looking at miniatures and starting to come up with ideas for armies. But anyway, there you go. A uh, Line Rampant Second Edition comes out this week. Um, I, I've somehow managed to end up with the rules early. <laughs> <coughs> I, I think a uh, mistake on the part of Blackwell's, a uh, bookshop in the UK. I think they just <laughs> sent it to me when I ordered it rather than on the day that it's meant to be released. So I've already read them. Yeah, uh, yeah it, it looks really good. It's quite a different game to, I think, what we're used to. Mm. Um it's got some really interesting mechanics. It's very sandboxy. Like you couldn't, you couldn't run this at a tournament. Not not if you 
like wanted to have fun anyway it, it, it would be too easy to exploit at a tournament and like there's an entire chapter in the book dedicated essentially to the author going here's some house rules you can play around with if you want to add them to the xj so it's more of a sandboxy kind of game to allow you to kind of um play in a historical setting but not have to deal with the the kind of uber um specific and complicated rule sets with a million tables which i think historical war games sometimes gets a bit of a association mm. with all that's that's probably unfair uh, when you think of games no. like bolt action things well yeah oh, but anyway good. Yes. <laughs> but anyway that that's coming out um this week i'm looking forward to starting a force for that that'll be good right next up then we're going to be talking all about articon for the rest of today's episode before that then our first musical track of the morning it's Pompeii by Bastille. That was Pompeii what? by Bastille, a great song, all about the uh, destruction of Pompeii in ancient Rome. <laughs> <laughs> very, very cheerful for a morning. There you go. <laughs> okay. There you go. It's a good song. Have you not heard it before? I don't think I have. I, I, I have. think I think you definitely have. Maybe, maybe, maybe I have, but I just haven't really. I think it. you just probably haven't listened to the lyrics. Maybe. But anyway, moving swiftly on, we're going to be talking about Articon. So, um, OT and myself were not there. So we, we cannot claim any of this glory that the, the mayor has... Uh, uh, you know, my association. <laughs> you you, you were definitely true. my hype men during the tournament. Yeah, exactly. We were, we were. were. Yeah, I also right. feel like, as I have at some point beaten mayor at SBG, that therefore means that I am better than the person <laughs> who finished in the top 20 at Articon. And the haters will say that, you know, that's not how it works. But, you know, they're, just that, they're haters. Out. They just want to bring you, you down. You do. Let them you just assault you with the truth. Very, <laughs> very much true. If I want to manifest that I am better at middle earth strategy battle game than Mare, and that Mare has only ever played me with fun theme lists rather than a um, <laughs> competitive uh, list, a competitive <laughs> list. So those people are lying to themselves. Anyway, Mare, you were there for four days. I was there. Yep. Four days of uh, gaming. How was overall? Good. Uh, it was good overall. I'd say um, it maybe lacked some of the themey funness of previous years. There were no people walking around in costumes or um, people at stalls having made um, cosplays. Uh, there, there are a few stalls. Um, Generation Shift were there, which was great. Um, and um, obviously the bar was there, so that was important. But other than that, um, th there wasn't anything massively special. Um, previous years, uh, there was even like a puppet show at one point, um, which was actually amazing. But um, there was none of the uh, frivolous expenses of, of that. So, okay. um, Do you know was... because of COVID kind of disrupting things and this being kind of like a getting I'm... back to normal sort of thing? I'm not sure. I mean, COVID, obviously COVID cancelled last year's, so yeah. arguably even more time was available to prepare. But um, I think okay. nonetheless, everyone had a good time. Mm -hmm. um, and especially obviously our team, um, there were yep. uh, two events that happened. So it was Thursday to Sunday. Um, players from, I think, 26 countries came, um, definitely for the team championship. Um, that was on the Saturday, Sunday. And the doubles was uh, Thursday, Friday. And both tournaments were six games. Um, there were four games of singles on Saturday, which was um, very trying, but um, we managed to get through it. Yeah, and we we aren't going to spend a huge amount of time on the the doubles, and we'll get into why that is. But essentially, uh, you were running a particular list, and we're going to talk about this a little bit today as well because it's Legendary Legion. So we're going to at the end of today's episode have a conversation about putting it into our tier listing but very quickly what was the list what sort of force were you running 
Um, so the list was um, largely similar between the doubles and singles. I essentially used the doubles to practice the list with my brother. I've never used the list before. I use Isengard all the time. Um, mm -hmm. It is the army I started with and the army that I default to in pretty much every situation. But I've never run a Legion with it, uh, and I've certainly never run Assault on Helm's Deep. So... It was essentially uh, two captains with shield, um, one having the plus one wound and might from the legion. Uh, both warbands had five warriors with shields, six with crossbows and two with pikes. Uh, then I had a banner with pike and a bomb team with two flaming brands in the leader's warband. Um, and most importantly, of course, I had uh, two siege ballistas, um, <laughs> as one does. Um, yeah. So... Uh, were, were you playing with the recent FAQ or had that not taken effect? Yeah, so the six inch rule was in effect. Um, okay. it, it only came into effect in one or two of the games, okay. um, but it didn't make too much difference. I, I would say it would have made a difference, um, but it, it was essentially there to stop the ballista from preventing someone who's in base contact with it from destroying it during during a turn because you could just shoot them off. Yeah. And if, if anyone listening is interested, I will um, post the army list in the uh, description of today's episode as well, so you can have a look at it in full. Uh, very, very quickly then, experience of the doubles, how did it go? Um, I think uh, anyone who has a doubles list that has an element of slow moving, or in the ballista's case, uh, basically not moving at all is going to be in big trouble because all of the double scenarios bar one or two I think essentially involve you deploying across the board from uh, not your opponent but your ally um, and actually basically all of the double scenarios involve you desperately trying to get to your ally to survive a potential two on one from your opponents um, and when you've got two siege ballistas just sit sit sitting there it's very difficult to um, join up forces and uh, it it meant that the blisses either died really early or um, they just uh, uh, weren't really used very much at all so mm -hmm. um, a couple of things did happen that were quite interesting I learned quite a lot I learned that Ballistas don't, in fact, have a firing arc, which I always just assumed. And then one of my opponents asked me why I wasn't deploying them in the corner um, facing each other to create, like, some weird cage fortress. And I was like, well, how are you supposed to fire them? Like, they're, they're just looking off the map. And he was like, show me the paragraph that says that they have a firing arc. And I couldn't find it. And he was like, this is how a lot of people play it. You just draw line of sight from the crew and in the way line of sight from the top of the ballista. Um, so apparently that's perfectly fine. Um, I think it needs a firing arc, and I think ballistas need to be at least 10 points more expensive, but that's just my opinion. Uh, my brother did manage to kill a dragon with about five in the ways, which was quite impressive. Nice. Uh, we also managed to shoot into a combat with an opponent's Mahud King, who... Um, has two mites, but rolled a one for their fate, so they couldn't mite it to a four. And they instantly died. Um, the bomb didn't do too much in the doubles, did a few wounds to Shelob, uh, failed to kill, kill some Eastling heroes. Uh, but we did manage to kill three Rohan heroes at once with it, at one point, which was quite good. Um, and the uh, Ballistas also managed to shoot off the... Uh, what's the new East... Is it the Dragon Emperor? That's the yeah. one in the... Yes, so yep. we managed to instant kill his throne, which was really nice. So he was really glad that he dumped seventy quid or whatever it is on on that miniature. I reckon that needs a buff. I reckon. It needs I think he needs a buff. Yeah, I think it made stronger. It's just it, it, don't get value for point. <laughs> so um, yeah, so doubles. Um, I think it would have been nicer just to play the single scenarios with a teammate, so that we can actually you know use each other's forces. Most people just took like a solid force and then something that could move really fast to get across the board to their ally. Yeah. So what what were the actual rules then for selecting your force? Because you essentially were just using a single army but piloted by two people, which 
wasn't how I imagined a doubles tournament working, to be honest. Yeah, so um, I didn't have to look too much into it because uh, I knew that you could take the Legion with two people. Um, if you took a Legion, you both had to take it. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, if you took a Vanilla Army, they just had to be Green Alliance, I believe, or maybe Yellow Alliance. I can't remember exactly. I think you could be Yellow Alliance. Um, so Allies of Convenience, I think it is. But um, I think most people did uh, take the same force, to be honest. Um, no, the doubles, the doubles was fine. Um, I, th I think, in hindsight, it was it was extremely draining because my army couldn't do what it's meant to do. I and by which I mean sit at the back and shoot my opponents <laughs> and watch them cry. Um, no, it's. I, I think it it would have been more fun having taken few a fewer miniatures that don't involve too much thinking. So basically, my list. Nice, nice. <laughs> um, right, the scenario we... ruined it basically. But yes, okay. Should we move on to the the singles then? Sounds good. Sure. Which I think um, is the the real kind of yeah. meat what the... meat of what we're going to be uh, talking. The man flesh, the if want. you will. The nice. man, the man flesh, if you will. Yes. So um, you were all in teams. So whilst there was the kind of uh, opportunity to win on your own. You also had a kind of system where the top four people in each team go through into a kind of pool and you work out based on kind of where they are, who wins. I believe that's correct, isn't it? Um, yes, essentially. So um, there are teams made, of, made up of up to nine people and the four people who did best in each team get their scores added together and that's essentially your team score. So you could lose every single game as long as the top four people in your team did really, really well. Um, uh, yes, that's essentially it. Um, there are also oaths. So uh, if you win, it doesn't matter how much you win by. Um, it, I think it was five points. Um, it, it counts as a minor win. Uh, there were three oaths that you could choose from. Uh, and your opponent could veto an oath each game, and then you had to select one of the two remaining oaths and keep that secret. And if you scored it by the end of the game, uh, then you could turn your minor win into a major win, or your uh, major defeat, which is the default, into a minor defeat, which is essentially the difference of one tournament point. Um, but seeing as a draw is two tournament points, for every two oaths you get, you essentially convert a loss into a draw. So the oaths become the first tiebreaker and are actually quite important. Okay. And like for scenarios, does everybody play the same one? So in each round, does everybody play like Reconnoiter or something? Like, does everybody play the same one or are they chosen between you and your opponent? Um, so everyone does the same one. Um, okay. In the match play guides uh, on page nine, there are pools. So they've grouped all of the kind of similar scenarios into threes. Mm. So you've got Maelstrom of Battle scenarios, object scenarios, maneuvering scenarios, hold objective, kill the enemy, and unique scenarios, which are like the weird ones. Yeah. Um, so the online system they were using, Tawny, would uh, select the pool, and then it would randomly decide which of those three scenarios in that pool everyone would be playing for that round. Okay. Were there any scenarios you were particularly worried about going? I mean, maybe this is jumping in too quickly, but like before the tournament, were there any that you were particularly worried about? Um, I was a little bit worried about um, Reconnoiter because most of my <laughs> army uh, is designed to kind Doesn't of sit move. back and shoot. <laughs> uh, uh, having said that, I do have 38 models, which is a yeah. fair amount. And the only other one is Maelstrom Battle scenarios. Mm. Um, most of them are grouped into one pool. And uh, so I knew there was going to be at least one, but essentially my blisters have to deploy before anyone comes onto the board. So my opponent knows where they need to come on to just yeah. wreck my blisters instantly. Yeah. Um, so that was the main worry. Uh, other than that, I think most of the scenarios, it just depended on what my opponent had. Okay, nice. And going into the tournament, what was your aim? Were you hoping to 
kind of, you know, you do really well? Were you going in with a really competitive mindset? Were you more kind of there just to see how it went? Well, because there were so many people uh, in our team, I think we had 15 people and obviously you can only have nine. So we had to decide between ourselves who wanted to be competitive and who was uh, going to try and just have more fun and, and be in a secondary team. And I told uh, our team captain, I want to be in a competitive team. So I really felt the need to prove myself and do well. We knew that based on previous years, you needed uh, your top four people to have at least four wins out of six. And you probably need one or two people to have five wins out of six. So it was uh, there was a lot of pressure on, um, especially as some a couple of the people that we were expecting to do quite well didn't have a very good start. Um, and I knew that uh, if my brother did quite well, then uh, maybe <laughs> maybe he should have been picked <laughs> instead of me. So, and because I'm taking a competitive list, I'm kind of expected to do well. And um, obviously, didn't get the practice I was hoping for in the doubles. So there, there was a bit of pressure, but I was going with a competitive mindset. Um, I enjoy those challenging kind of games, um, and I like it to be one or the other. I'd rather it be a crazy, fun game with um, random n narrative things happening, or the complete opposite, where you've just brought the cheesiest things possible and you're just trying your best to win, without being mm -hmm. attacked, of course. Yeah. Good. Right. Shall we then jump in and start looking at some of the games you played? So, first game. So, you've only played this Legendary Legion in the doubles tournament. It wasn't very ideally suited. So, you're thrown into a uh, game straight away. First time you've ever used this Legendary Legion on your own, I think. Is that right? That's right, yes. How did that first game go? Um, I think the first game. Um, was probably the epitome of playing Assault Upon Helm's Deep. Um, so the first game I was playing Domination, which is uh, the objective game. I think there are five markers. Um, I was playing against Minas Tirith with Boromir and Hurin on horse and Madril. So he had some uh, rangers. Um, I classically started in the corner. Um, <clears throat> he decided it would be a good idea to charge uh, head first with basically all his stuff. <clears throat> Having left behind um, a few dudes on objectives, uh, he did charge one half of my line, though. Um, by the time he reached combat, he was close to breaking, so I kind of collapsed that side and continued shooting. Um, he soon decided it probably wasn't a good idea to just um, suicide too hard, so he fell back with Boromir. Um, Realising he was about to break, he thought he'd try and end the game really quickly, so he threw as much stuff into combat as he could, uh, but I ended up shielding most uh, of my warriors against him because I could tell what he was trying to do. Um, slipped out 80% uh, of my army around his remaining force and started flooding the board as fast as I could. Uh, by the time he was 25 percented, um, I'd taken the majority of the objectives. And in the last turn, uh, he had Boromir on an objective with um, a uh, friendly warrior behind a tree. Uh, my ballista shot, hit Boromir, scattered onto his friend, got past the tree, killed his friend, and then the second ballista hit Boromir uh, straight on, um, instant killed Boromir because he was out of fate and still had five might points left. Um, there was some salt, <laughs> not going to lie. <laughs> there was. Pretty understandably, to be fair. Yes. Um, do, you, do you think there was... Well, I'm sure there was a way to beat you but do you always feel like in that scenario it was just kind of case of did he really have much of an alternative of just trying to close with you with the less that you've got um i think he he could have actually won it if he'd um just committed to trapping me in as fast as possible and dying as fast as possible which i know sounds like <laughs> the sort of game you don't necessarily want to have to play but um, it, it's yeah. like um, he could do that or he could um, try and sit back and hide and just not move for the whole game um, but I think if he wanted the win he had to try and get in as fast as possible um, keep his heroes back for the courage um, and let all of his warriors just flee as fast as possible They do you always feel like 
he should have just committed more to his initial plan and that by backing off he kind of yeah. the floor. Yeah. He definitely should have. Um and I did have the bomb uh being carried alongside uh, the majority of my force while I was slipping out. I think he was thinking that by cl clumping all his guys up, I was just going to send the bomb in and finish them yeah. off, which would have ended the game. Um, but obviously I wasn't going to do that. So I just took the bomb to make sure Boromir thought twice about charging the rest of my army as they floated into the middle of the board. Um, so that was the first game. Um, I did manage to get my oath because it was to kill Hurin. I figured, well, I, w I was assuming he was going to come to me. Um, and uh, luckily he did. So right. for your for your oaths, you said you get to veto one of them. How do they pick which one to veto, or is it just random, or what happens? So uh, there are only three oaths, and yeah. um, you roll off. Whoever has the highest roll um, mm. vetoes first. So if I roll a six and you roll a one, I would mm. choose one of the oaths that you yeah. are now not allowed to pick. Okay. Uh, and now you have to pick one of the two remaining. Um, and then you do the same to me. Okay. Are O's set? Is this something where every single game there were the same O's or were the O's tailored to the different games? Um, in previous years, I think there were six O's and you had to take each one once. But mm -hmm. in this particular case, there were three O's that were available every single game. Um, one was to kill any enemy captain, uh, not captain, any enemy, enemy hero with your leader. Uh, one was to kill your opponent's most uh, valuable hero, excluding the leader. And the other one was to have more models within six inches of an objective that's placed before the game by whoever wins a roll-off. So, And you have to do that um, regardless of... Uh, what you or your opponent have picked because obviously you don't know if your opponent's picked that or not. Oh, uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. I'm surprised then that he didn't veto because it, 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 excuse me if I'm wrong, but it seems with your list that the easiest one to achieve would be trying to kill one of the heroes because you just ballista fire and, or maybe, I guess maybe he thought it would be easy to hide here and. Mm. I think part of him perhaps wanted me to pick uh, the my hero killing one of his because right. then that might tempt tempt me out to try and kill um, kill one and then Boromir comes in. But yeah. um, uh, yes, I'm surprised as well. I thought he might veto that one and hope that I went for the objective marker one, seeing as I was blatantly going to sit back. But <laughs> perhaps he thought I was going to, you know, not sit back in a little little fortress of ballistas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how wrong he was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should we do the next game? Yeah, let's let's go on. So, um, wins the first game, good start. What was the second game like? Uh, so this one was um, against one of the players that did very well um, and podiumed in the Masters. Um, it was uh, Reconnoiter which uh, is obviously the game I feared. And it was against <laughs> Angmar with Gullivar and the Witch King um, and a Jeez. captain. So for this one, um, Gullivar obviously doesn't have any fate. So if I wound him with a ballista, then he will instantly die. Mm. Um, there wasn't a lot of places for him to hide, but pretty much everywhere he went, he had at least two in the ways from my ballistas and at least one other guy to scatter on to. Um, so essentially what happened was he was at the back of the board, um, all his stuff came on and started kiting sideways, which I thought was quite strange. I thought maybe he was trying to put me off with his deployment and just go the other way. Um, but he made sure every turn that he was out of 24 inch range of my crossbows. Um, my ballistas did nothing to Gullivar um, for the first few turns because he was, he was behind terrain. Um, when I realized that he was probably just playing for a draw because he was taking meticulous time over moving each orc, um, despite it blatantly being out of 24 inches. Uh, every time I lost priority, I'd move forward six inches, which would force him to move sideways and back six inches. Um, that way he couldn't move forward into my crossbows because he gets shot if I'd won priority. Mm. Um, so yes, I kept, kept uh, missing Gullivar with the blisters, killing the odd orc, um, 
I checked the VPs because I thought, this is a really weird game. I wonder what he's trying to do. And I realized that there was a point for killing leader. So I assumed his tactic was going to be to jump out with the Witch King in the last couple of turns and maybe try and black dart my leader just to get a point. So I made sure to hide my leader. I was spending a couple of turns taking him towards a tree that he was going to uh, take a nap behind. Um, but um, I made a fatal error because I moved an orc in range of a spectre, I believe it is, that can compel someone. Is that right? Um, yeah, yeah, the dead my spectres, yeah. Yeah, so the spectre uh, moved out, um, compelled one of my crossbows into charge range of Gulliver, who charged him. Um, I then missed both of my ballista shots into the combat, um, which would have been uh, quite a lucky hit if I had got it. Um, he then uh, combated off that um, crossbow, moved 12 inches towards my board edge. I was thinking he, that he was going to go for my leader kill, uh, but instead he just took Gulliver straight off the board oh. uh, in the next turn. <laughs> and I, I was thinking to myself, but doesn't he need three to score any points? And I checked it and it's just, you just need more than your opponent. It's only, it's more points when you get more. Yeah. But at this point, I was behind. Uh, I was losing and I had nothing to lose. So at this point, I, I spent no time thinking about what I was doing. I moved everyone six inches forward as fast as I possibly could. Um, got within 10 inches of his board edge, at which time, at which point I realised that I was actually quite close to breaking him. And he decided it would be better to commit guys to stop me getting off the board and fight me, um, except... I ended up killing those people and broke him. So he would have been better off keeping them back and not letting them die um, because by breaking him, I uh, drew the game. Okay. So I, I clutched a draw from uh, the jaws of defeat, luckily from, from neglect. I mean, you've got to be very happy with that result because not only was the, the game kind of going against you at that kind of midsection, but also it was the... The yeah, scenario you're fearing against an opponent with an army that kind of is a tricky one in the scenario. So you happy with that? Um, yes, I was very happy with um, managing to fix my error and uh, clutching a draw. But uh, Gulliver's scary. I really yeah. thought he was going to do a lot with it, mm -hmm. and then by taking him off the board, mm -hmm. I just felt like I had free reign. There was absolutely mm -hmm. nothing I could do. Mm -hmm. and if, if the game continued. Um, I would have been off the board, but fair play to him. He, he let me play uh, another turn with five minutes to go. Um, and we did manage to get through the turn before time had run out. So um, he could have slow played me really hard, but he didn't. So, Wow, that's good. Yeah. And the problem, like Gulliver is, uh, any model with fly is a real problem to deal with. And like, especially with your army that's built on, you know, trying to sort of almost like hold them off as it were, and let the ballistas do work. Like all it took was that one like tiny mistake and the spectre moves him in and then heroic combat. And like suddenly your move goes from, you know, 12 inches to effectively 24. And that's a huge amount of the boards if they can heroic combat off it. And all it took was like, you're saying that one mistake as it were, which was such a minor thing. And that yeah, yeah nearly cost you the game, which is pretty mad. Yeah, um, I mean, he, apparently he was saying he was playing for a draw anyway, mm. and he was quite surprised I wasn't more aggressive up the board, um, which yeah. I took took note of. But the main thing I took note of was read the bloody scenario. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why was he playing for a draw? Why wasn't he just going for a win? There? Um, I think if he moved um, Gulliver out too quickly, uh, I would have obviously shot and killed him with a ballista. It would have taken him two turns to get to me. Um, he couldn't move it up with his dudes because they died to my 12 crossbows. Um, he just had an army of orcs with the Witch King and, and Gulliver, essentially. Um, his model count wasn't massively high. He had a few wargs, which I managed to snipe. But um, I, I think he just couldn't take a straight fight. Um, and he didn't want to lose. I think that was the main thing. He wanted a draw, yeah. if nothing else, because he knew um, a loss would be much much worse for, for his overall tournament i mean like as soon as you're taking gulavar and the witch king in a 650 point list that's only going to leave you with what like 300 points like if that if they're fully kitted 
Like yeah. it, it's it really knocks your your model count. And like some people looking at the lists that that you sent us, like some people are taking like 50, 60 models. And the fact that yours wasn't that high a model count with thirty eight or something, wasn't it? Is is a yeah. bit scary. And like you didn't have any big heroes, obviously you got the ballistas, but yeah, you do sacrifice a lot by taking those bigger heroes. Yeah, and I'm I there's so many armies that take uh, Nazgul or or something to deal with a big hero mm. and by not having a target for that you're not having to rely on that big hero like the Helm Hammerhand Legion if you're yeah. transfixing him uh, you're that's done it, like <laughs> yeah. he, he can deal with basically any problem mm. but if he's if he's taken out by something um, then essentially you, you, you can't deal with anything mm. yeah Spread your threats, I guess, is the advantage of your army. Yeah, the ballistas are very much the distraction card effects, um, <laughs> and the uh, yeah, it, it's it's either come well, to me to do with ballistas. You've got, a, you've got a demolition team as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's a brilliant combination because um, the ballistas force my opponents to come to me, um, and the bomb just protects me and and essentially yeah, guarantees that the that bomb's going to have an opportunity. Yeah. Um, if I only had bombs, I'd be running to my opponent. Um, yeah. uh, a quite fun tactic I thought of on the way home, um, which I might have to try against one of you. Uh, so I apologise in advance, but it's essentially to take uh, a drummer uh, along with um, anyone who can march um, and a bomb team. Yeah. Um, because the threat range of that bomb um, is six inch movement plus uh, I think it's three for march obviously three for drum the drum so is it is a 12 inch move bomb <laughs> well uh, you, you'll be a, you'll be able to see a slightly less effective version of that in my eyes and god less you have one or two bombs two bombs two bombs, bombs. Oh my god. <laughs> all of my rohan here is really really gonna love that well, i imagine you'll be able to just keep me at arm's length yeah do you, do you have flaming brands um, I can't remember off the top of my head whether I had the point. There's a good chance I. Do. They're one point each. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should really I take them. Like you I, need I, them. I you have to take them. Yeah. I can 3D print you some little ones. <laughs> nah, it's all right. I'll just pretend that they've got some on their belts or something. Just haven't let them yet. Okay. I was wondering how they like the flaming brand at Helm's Deep. Are they just like Urukai in the rain gathered round? It's the, uh, the berserker's got that firework. He doesn't need. He it's doesn't a need firework. It's, uh, actually, it's like it's the sparking around in it. Yeah. Cigarette lighter. That's <laughs> yeah. a fact about Urukai. Chain smokers. <laughs> Why they live, live for such a short amount of time? Exactly. Yeah. They might as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although they are like you know three weeks old, so they're not they're not exactly. of age. Chain smoking babies. They, effectively they, all, they all died from the smoking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Should we yeah. move on to the next game? I was yeah. going to say, actually, I think we'll, we'll just very quickly just jump to our second song and then we'll return to the, the third game. Our next song, then, something that all war gamers are very familiar with it's Fake Plastic Trees by Radiohead. And that was Fake Plastic Trees by Radiohead there. Uh, right, so two games in, win and a draw, good start. We enter our third game. How did it go? Uh, game three, uh, I played against Old Dane with Thorin Stonehelm. Um, it was Maelstrom, and um, it was uh, the table quarter scenario. So the more guys you have in more table quarters, uh, the more points you score. Um, yeah. My ballistas had to deploy first, so I deployed them in kind of a V shape on uh, the long edge of um, on the long edge. They're all the same length. Um, <laughs> on the <laughs> in the middle of an edge. Um, yeah. <laughs> nice. Was it the long uh, edge or the short edge? It was the. The long edge of the. You think about kill teams. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, I kind of trapped my crew in there to protect them. Uh, the dwarves, uh, he he rolled beautifully, and they both warbands came on either side of the blisters. Uh, long, long edge or short edge? 
uh, the short edge, uh, the dwarves, of course. Short edge of a um, square table. <laughs> the, the dwarves wrapped around really tightly onto the ballistas. Um, we couldn't find a rule that said he couldn't hit them in combat. I'm pretty sure he can't, having having looked at it. But I allowed it because he didn't end up killing them. Uh, I said, if if you end up killing them, then we'll have a look. Um, of course, um, I also managed to roll fairly well. I uh, just had to use a might, I think. And I counter-ambushed him. My bomb came on, and there's nothing to say. It can't detonate turn oh, one, so um, I blew up, <laughs> I blew up eight crap. dwarves. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a, about 100 points of dwarves gone instantly. Um, yeah. But it did cost me maybe 30 points worth of stuff, and um, he immediately killed my ballistas. The six-inch rule coming into play here, because... He was so tightly packed in, I, I couldn't shoot anyone. So the ballistas did literally nothing that game. So um, even with my bomb trade, I think I came out worse points-wise in that. Yeah. Um, we then just basically slugged it out um, for the whole game. And uh, he killed both my heroes. I managed to sneak away a couple guys during the combat because I had uh, more models. Um, they got to the other quarters of the table he didn't quite 33% me, so I didn't have to do any courage tests, um, and time ran out. So um, I won having uh, been in control of all four table quarters. Nice. Nice. And a good win, considering that, of course, again, it, the scenario didn't really play to your strengths. You kind of lost some big hitters straight away, but still managing to sneak around. I guess the dwarf so heavily committed to that corner that they then didn't have the movement to actually win the objective, did they? Well, it was it was in the middle of one of the edges. Um, so he, I think he did have a couple of opportunities where he could have snuck away. Okay. Um, but he just stuck to the fights like a true dwarf. Um, oh, yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, di didn't manage to get the objectives. Um, but did manage to deny me an oath in the last turn by killing... Um, an Urukai that would have meant I was holding the objective four models to three, but instead it was three to three, which means I didn't get my oath. So he did, did he deny have, me that. Did he bring um, goat riders and things like that? Was that something? Uh, he did. He had a captain on goat rider and okay. two goat riders. Okay. Um, they were pretty good. Um, I think. Yeah. Um, I know Stonehelm isn't rated particularly highly, but he managed to basically kill everything he touched anyway. So. Um, I really felt the pain of strength three armies needing sixes to kill yeah. dwarves, and they were killing me on fives. Um, just knowing that they kill me twice as fast was yeah. uh, scary. Well, because it, it's always been, you know, uh, the the thing that dwarves have in their favour is that if you can get them into the right position on the board, it's bloody hard to shift them. But like it is, it is that lack of maneuverability, and you know those goat riders. Yes, they are expensive, but giving dwarves access to some cavalry does give yeah. them so much, so many more options. Um, so I think yeah, if that... he just ran a goat across the board, yeah, like as soon as he could, or just sent one model off, yeah. Um, but I, I think he was just too fixated on wiping me out. Yeah. Because they're tough, aren't? And like, I mean, the goats are pretty high defense. Like, they they, they would have obviously. You, I don't know how many guys you sent off, but I imagine you know if he had sent those goats after them, he would have killed at least one. Oh or yeah, two. I, I sent yeah. one guy to each quarter. Nice. Um, I knew I wasn't going to have to take a courage test, and I really mm. couldn't spare more than one guy. It was so close. We yeah. were killing each other at a proportional rate, apart mm. from the fact that he had two heroes still at the end, and I didn't. Okay. Um, but they were they were beastly. Dane is actually really good. Old old Dane is is yeah. still really good. He's a six inch banner, I think. It's it's three or six. Yeah, but he's, and he's he's, he's I, I'm going to say only one thirty, but like um, for one thirty, that's not too bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, just looking at his rules now. Yeah, wow, and he gets a master forge hand and a half axe. That's pretty powerful. Cool. So that was game three. Should we do game four? Yeah, we can be on to game four. So game four then. So game four was against uh, Assault on Lothlorien, which is the one where all the 
uh, goblins get plus one to wound and it's night time. But of course, because they have, and there's plus one to wound and shooting, they have a uh, cage dweller, so they ignore the 12 inch range bubble for missile troops. Um, so they get to shoot their usual 18, which felt really scary. I think he only managed to kill two people um, from shooting. So um, he massively um, outnumbered me, um, but I think I managed to get the best positioning I could and held off uh, his swarms. I managed to position most of my crossbows in such a way that I got shots on his guys without being in line of sight of his uh, archers, which was quite good. Um, so I thinned the ranks a bit. Um, he kept his named heroes back, but made a fatal error of bringing his captain really far forward uh, into one of the Ascilith ruin terrain pieces. Um, the one with uh, that looks like the front of the building with an arch in the middle and a platform above it. Mm. So uh, I kind of baited him into coming through the door um, then I charged into a near nearby goblin with the captain, combated off him into the uh, enemy captain, uh, trapped him, uh, killed him. I used my last might to guarantee the kill. I wasn't sure if I should or not, but I'm glad I did because I essentially spent the rest of the game protecting all of my heroes um, because at that point, um, that was the only difference between us. We didn't break each other. Um, we didn't score any points apart from me killing his hero, which was quite lucky because it was also the oath I took to kill an enemy hero with my leader. Yeah. So I got a two for one um, and managed to win that game. It's really like all the games you've talked about so far, like you are able to pick out like this one like key moment from each of them that kind of flipped it. And it does um, sound like because all of these games, it sounds like everybody's taking it quite seriously at the tournament, especially when you're w winning multiple games on the opening day, like the margins are often really, really tight. And like you talked about with your game, that was the draw, the fact it was what one all or something in victory points, something like that. Like, yeah, it, it really is super close. And if you make one mistake, even if it seems like quite insignificant, it can like sort of run out of control a bit as you have to like, cause like if your army had to switch from being defensive to being more aggressive and chasing somebody down, you'd suddenly be in quite a lot of trouble. Yeah, um, so that the draw was um, three all because he was broken without me being broken. Um, okay. And he, I think he had three for coming off. It was either that or it was, yeah, one all. They are really fine margins. And the more I played uh, competitive players, the more I realised, essentially, I just need to look at what can I score realistically and what are they going to try and score realistically. Mm. Um, and if they don't want to commit to trying to break me or I don't want to commit to trying to break them. You're really scrimping to try and find points and deny your opponent points because you know that, you know, I might get one point for killing uh, an enemy captain. Um, I might get one point for having a banner because they don't. And it all hinges on this uh, minuscule probability of trying to get a fluky point or two. Yeah. It does and make like, it really interesting and really challenging. So, for instance, the banner in your list, is, is it there with, like, the victory points in mind? Or is it there, obviously, I, banners are good, but, like, is the fact that it's potentially a victory point a, a really important reason to bring it? Or is that not something you're really considering? I think for my list, um, if my opponent is in combat with me, I'm probably doing something wrong. So the nice. banner isn't... <laughs> the banner isn't uh, as useful in combat. I, yeah. I don't think I, I don't think I really used it very much while there was kind of a battle line going on. Mm. Um, it was definitely mainly for points, um, which ends up being summed up in the last game where I literally hide my banner and lie him down on the floor because there's a point for banner <laughs> and I just yep. need to prevent my opponent yep. getting it. So definitely points first, mm. um, much less so for usability um, in combat, for my list particularly. If I took my usual named Captain Isengard um, melee list, it would have seen a, a lot more uh, combat for sure. Because I suppose like the advantage with the banner as well is it's not that specific model that has to stay alive. You just have to keep a model with the banner. So yeah. as long as you can like protect it and there is a model alive and then you can run away, 
it can kind of do a little bit of a job in combat and then you can like run away and hide behind your blisters or a tree or whatever like and it becomes like a mobile victory point or whatever so i suppose that is a reason if you are playing really competitively even if you don't think a banner is going to be super useful to put one in your list yeah definitely um and they look beautiful as well can't yeah. can't deny yeah, that you, you, an army with a banner much, is great yeah you pretty much always want a banner in yeah. most middle earth armies don't you they're just useful for so many different reasons in the and they're game. kind of like an extra attack in combat aren't they like for the they definitely are, yeah. well but not to wound but to in the dual role so like yeah it's and it's if, not, if you're not if you're not taking one you're you're basically just handing your opponent opportunities to score points that you can't get yeah, yeah. that that is yeah especially when some people are trying to play for draw in a competitive <laughs> tournament yeah. and uh you you have literally gifted them the win there like yeah. if they don't if they don't need to come towards you, um, they won't. <laughs> they will. I, I literally on the top table during uh, the fifth game are um, the people next to us. Um, literally got about two turns in, and then they looked at each other's armies and they both agreed. Neither of them wanted to move out because they were going to play for a draw. So they just shook hands and went and had a, <laughs> had a beer. It literally took them twenty minutes and. Uh, I think they they could have just played a fun game after that if they wanted to, but they had so many models. It was like they, they yeah. just packed up. Yeah. Um, that, it's a lot that's of kind of yeah. It, it does come down to that sometimes. They were really nice about it. They were just like, yeah, we're we're both just going to play for draw. Um, I'm happy with that. A, a yeah. draw's not a loss. So <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So was that was it the seems for seems interesting yeah. though that they'd be willing to. <laughs> I mean, these tournaments aren't free to go to. It always feels to me like I'm not getting your value. But then me. also, like, they are playing a lot of games. Like, it, True. It, it, I, in, I compar in comparison to what you or I play, for instance, like, I've, I've never been to <laughs> Like, when, when, yeah. we, when we catch up and play, like, two or three games over a weekend. I mean, Matt when... did play more games over a four-day span than we probably play in a year, so... Yeah. Yeah, but like yeah. if we play like two or three <laughs> over over a weekend, we're like, oh, that's a bit much. But if you're playing like yeah. four four like intense games in a day, I can definitely see why you're like, I'm playing for a draw, sod it, let's go and have a beer. Yeah, uh, I rate that mentality more more understandable. Yeah. So that that was end of day one. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so that was yeah. the end of Saturday. And so at that point. Quite a few of your team were doing quite well, weren't they? So you you'd gone unbeaten. Uh, yes, three wins and a draw. Draw. And then a few of your teammates were in a kind of similar situation. Um, yes. However, at this point, um, it emerged that one of the guys that we kind of expected to do quite well, um, was on I think two losses at this point, um. And so it might have even been two losses and a draw. I can't remember, but uh, they weren't looking too good. And it was up. I, I was in fourth or third position in our team at this point, and it seemed like it was up to me to not lose a game. Hopefully, in the last last day, or at least get one win to get four wins and a draw. So that that was my aim. I mean, my aim was obviously to win two games, but yeah. Um, yeah, but there's quite quite a lot of pressure then going in. So it wasn't okay. Were you guys kind of thinking we we could win the team competition here, or were you a bit more kind of cautious in your optimism? Um, we definitely were because the tournament system also updated with the team rankings, and at that point, I think we were in first, so it was ours to lose essentially. Nice. Okay. So four four games in a day, which should come after two games, a lot of SBG, and you head into your fifth game. How did the fifth game go? So the fifth game was against Black Riders, which um, I'd seen this guy previously on a table next to me, and uh, he just looked completely bored of playing. Um, he was just like, yep, yeah, I'm just going to move forward. I'm just going to Black Dart you. Oh, there's six guys who have just died from Black Darts. Now I'm just going to run away because I'm cavalry. Um, so I was hoping I was going to give him a, a challenge. And I know that um, I told you the Black Riders probably weren't very good. Um, well, I can certainly say I was definitely wrong about that. You should definitely get Black Riders. <laughs> um, 
So this particular mission, we essentially start in um, table halves, but diagonally and three inches away from the center line. Um, you've also got an objective that's 15 inches in from your uh, corner towards the middle of the board, and it's like capture the flag. So if if your objective is where it starts um, at the end of the game, then your opponent doesn't score any points for that. If your opponent moves it um, but aren't holding it, they get some points. But if they're, they're, they're holding it in their half, they get points, etc. So um, I obviously sat back at the beginning. Um, he sat behind a building that was about 30 inches from my corner um, so that I couldn't see him and sent out one black rider um, sat on top of the objective, which I assumed he was hoping that I was going to whiff all my shots. And next turn, he was going to dismount grab the objective and move it and there's therefore score points by the end of the game. And then he'd run off. What he did instead was go onto the objective black dart, my leader, which in the first turn I saved with his fate points and a might. Um, then he, uh, I obviously killed his black rider with my insane amount of firepower. He then did the same, the second turn. <laughs> and I thought to myself, he black darted me first. And I was like, that's fine. Um, and I thought, now I've really got to kill him because otherwise he's going to score a point. Little did I know he's already scored a point because he's just wounded my leader. Um, uh, I, uh, for some reason, didn't think about that at all. I obviously didn't read the mission carefully enough. I, I was too fixated on the fact that he was about to move the objective, which, as it turns out, I also didn't realise that if you put it back um, by the end of the game, then they don't score any points for it. So even if he'd moved it and then I'd shot him, I, I could have gone and grabbed the objective and put it back where it was. So um, it was too late. Um, I, I thought I'll bait him out one more time because I've got another wound um, and then I'll go and lie down behind a ballista. Uh, but he just flat out told me, I'm sorry, Jack, the rest of the game is going to be boring for you. I'm going to run away because I've got one point. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh -huh. um, and it's at this point, I realised I needed to do what I did in the Reconnoiter game and essentially run at him and force him to do something about it. Um, I think he assumed I just wouldn't have enough time to get across the board, um, but he really underestimated my urgency as he saw me <laughs> just measure out nine inches. Priority uh, six model. inches. <laughs> yeah. I was, um, so every time, again, I lost priority, priority um, he, he'd make me check. I had like a laser pointer line, which was really useful. So he, I, I, we just made sure that my blisters couldn't see him. If I lost priority, I'd move them so that next turn I could still shoot with them. And I moved them around the sides of the board to force him uh, behind some of the other buildings. Managed to get into the middle of the board with most of my army and crossbows. He was really having to think hard at this point, to the point where uh, he was like, I, I literally just need like a few minutes to think about this. I mean, he has so many options. He, he had mm. five black riders. They've all got magic. He could do so many things. Um, it, it must be so hard when you're in a difficult position to think about all the things you could do, whereas there's not a lot I could do. I couldn't shoot him. All I could do was move up and force him to make decisions and hopefully make a mistake. So I was just gunning it towards his end, where the objective was, and also the oath that I assumed I was never going to get near, which was the mission objective, because, of course, I denied him from using the one that was just uh, kill one of my heroes with your leader because he would have just black darted me. Um, so uh, I ended up getting my oath by the end of the game. Um, he black darted my um, bomb. Um, and on the, oh. on the third wound, it blew up uh, and killed, killed two of my <laughs> siege crew. Um, the first time he did it, um, we we called the judge quite a few times only to, to make sure that we were doing the right thing. We came to our own consensus and the judge agreed with us every time. I assumed that uh, you know, it says about shooting attacks and I'm not that familiar with magic, but um, uh, the judge said, well, it's a kind of a magic shooting attack, so we'll let him have it. Um, and at that point, I had like my captain and about five guys around the bomb. <laughs> um, I, luckily, I rolled a two on the 
on the D6 and not a 6 to blow it up. But by the time it did go off, it, it only killed two guys. Um, I then, then managed to grab the objective and move it. But again, what I hadn't realised was if he puts it back, then he wins the game. Now there's about four minutes left. Um, it's the last uh, round. I don't have any mites. I, I win priority. He does a heroic move. He compels the guy that's just picked up the objective back an inch to where he was when he picked it up. Oh. Black darts him <laughs> with another with another guy, and then moves on to the wow. objective with his um, cavalry. So even if I run in there and kill his cav, um, mm. I can't do anything about it. Um, wow. I can't shoot him off the objective because I don't have a move. I can't move on to it to grab it. And the judge ruled that because the way it's worded, um, it says if it has moved from its original position, then um, I get points. So because it hasn't moved from its original position, even though it moved away and then moved back. Moved back. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I thought it was quite crafty uh, yeah. in a good way, in, a, in yeah. like a, well, fair play, like I've really been outclassed you, here, you, kind of way. You, you've read the scenario. <laughs> you've read the scenario. <laughs> and I agree um, so uh, I think a couple more turns, and I might have won. But um, yeah. it's one of those where I really enjoyed the gamesmanship of it. Um, yeah. You know, I wasn't worried that there was some weird fluff thing happening mm. or not happening, as it turned out. It's evil against evil, and uh, I just really enjoyed having to desperately try and win and force him to make decisions so yeah so you should buy, like, buy black riders is what i'm saying yeah i kind of feel like this is like the beauty of <clears throat> middle earth spg though in that like you can win with like such different sorts of armies mm. like that that list seven models is able to win through very careful management of the game and what those models can do and it's kind of like balance on a level that you don't really get with other games because you, you can get balance in other games, like, you know, armies can be balanced against each other if they take a certain sort of list, but you really can take such a wide variety of lists and still you can win in this game. Well, I mean, yeah. look, at, look at Jay Clare. Like, he just brings, he, uh, he, he doesn't bring, like, batshit crazy lists, but he doesn't bring, like, the most meta lists to these tournaments. And he just keeps doing really, really well. Like, I think it is a testament that, there is clearly a lot of skill in the game. And if you can, yeah. if you're willing to micro those decisions and really, really think, like you're saying the guy took two or three minutes out to just like think about how he could win, especially with a Legion like this, where you do have a lot of tools, but also you do only have seven models. And like, you have to make sure you're, you like clearly he'd thought about how he was going to win with like moving that guy out, black darting mm. and then sacrificing it. Like, that's not a sustainable strategy if he thinks the game's going to go really long because he won't have any models left. But if he knows he can just get there at that point and just get the, the points he needs to win, then like that's clearly a, that's the, the strategy to go for if you think that's the only way you can actually win the game. Yeah. It's definitely a high skill threshold yeah. kind of game. Like it's, yeah. it's very easy to learn, but very hard to master. I mean, you're right, Jay won with um, Lothlorien. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah. yeah, that's all I have to say about that. What a man! What a man! So not not the game you were hoping for from your team's perspective. So the final game then, the sixth game, you essentially have to win this, don't you? Um, I I have to win it to um be in the top four of my team, and if I don't, I might well still be in the top four of my team, but I'll have a lot less tournament points. Yeah. And w would it have meant that your team overall wouldn't have won, or have you not worked that out? Um, I, I don't think I want to work that out. Um, okay. <laughs> well, we'll leave it then. We we'll move. We move. We, yeah. we, 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 won't, move. we won't think too much about it. Um, and much like not thinking too much about it, we're going to play our last song, Don't Look Back Into the Sun by The Libertine. And that was Don't Look Back Into the Sun by the Libertines. So at the final stages now, it's the last game of Ardacon. Who do you match up against? Um, so I match up against... So, so now it's the kill something pool of games. And we played um, To the Death. It was against the Riders of Therden. So arguably, I've got a very themed 
master yeah. going on here. Yeah. Um, so all I have to do essentially, th this one's about breaking leader kills. Um, there's uh, points for banner as well. So I just have to shoot him and kill him, um, which is what the list is designed to do. Um, yeah. People in my team are coming up to me and saying, you've got this, mate. So now <laughs> the pressure's really on because they're assuming that this matchup is an auto win for me, essentially. Yeah. Just um, roll sixes. Just roll sixes. <laughs> just just, just, just shoot stuff, which is uh, hilarious because, um, of course, I deployed in the corner and in the first turn I killed four riders, which is great. Three of those were with a blister. Um, he marched up in the first and second turn. In the second turn, he's now in charge range. Um, I have a great opportunity here to dismount about 10 models. I've got 12 crossbows, two ballistas. I didn't kill a single fucking model in the second turn from shooting. <laughs> so uh, he charged me in the third turn. Um, luckily, I I'd managed to dissuade Theoden and Elfhelm from coming anywhere near. Uh, and because they were quite far away, um, I shot off a couple of guys that were nearby, which left Theoden and Elfhelm on their own. My ballista shot uh, hit Elfhelm back into Theoden, dismounted them both, won the next move off, got my bomb right next to both of them and blew them up with five mile left between them. Um, it was then just a grind of uh, melee as I desperately tried to stop his cavalry from killing everything. Um, he was killing stuff really fast. It's a really good legion. Yes. Um, uh, what's Eowyn's... Um, Dernhelm. I always forget it. Um, yep. She is really good. She's four attacks yep. on the charge. Yep. Um, it's just... It's, it's a bit much. <laughs> it's so good. Um, yep. I loved watching it, to be honest, because uh, he Theoden called um, you know, his death special rule. Yeah. Yep. Um, so the bomb goes off at the beginning of the fight phase, but he also calls death at the beginning of the fight phase. Beautifully timed. So he, he did it as he was exploding. So I imagine him being sort of cut off and uh, all of his heroes just went ham. Um, I then, uh, he, he didn't have quite enough dudes to spare anyone to go and try and disable a ballista. Um, I was always going to be able to stop him from doing that. And I left a 25 mil gap between my two ballistas in the corner, knowing full well that by the end of the game, I'd have to protect my leader and my banner. So uh, I managed to win priority, and he'd run out of mice at this point. Um, I moved my leader and my banner into the ballista fortress, closed the ballista fortress with my crew, um, and they spent the rest of the game lying down on the ground. So uh, since I'd blown up Theoden, and we'd both broken each other, the only thing differentiating us was the fact that I'd killed Theoden and, and, and I still had my leader. We both had uh, our banners. He had gambling and I had my banner. So uh, that was the end of uh, that game, really. Um, I tried going for um, the objective oath, but I'd forgotten all about it by the end of the game, to be honest. So I was nowhere near it. Um, I was too busy watching his Rohan gallop into my, into my lines. Yeah. yeah. Um, he played very bravely, um, but there was a lot that he probably should have done differently. Um, he'd essentially deployed on the same side of the table as me and just ran at me, but he could have gone back a tiny bit and approached from the other side of a building, which would have meant I couldn't have shot him for like two turns. Mm. Um, so things he could have done differently. Um, I don't know what I could have really done differently to help me. I think if he played it better, he might well have been able to win. And I'm definitely now going to have to buy the other Rohan heroes to uh, go with the ones I painted for our painting challenge. Mm. Yeah, it's a super good legion, isn't it? Like it, it obviously the, the gambling nerf toned it down a bit because it was a pretty crazy. I mean, it, it was <laughs> it was a bit much before, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it um, was the legion, wasn't it? Still, I mean, it's still really good now and. Like, I mean, all cavalry armies are, because, I mean, I assumed that something like Black Riders and Riders of Theoden would be really good against you because they can just close that gap more efficiently. But yeah. I guess you do have just about enough models to hold them at bay, like you're saying, and then just hang on until the end of the game. Because you're 
like what the ballistas give you is just a, such an effective tool for sniping off anybody who's a little bit careless. Um, yeah. And and I am shooting it into combat as well. There there yeah. is no reason for me to not. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. Definitely. And like, I think the the way it sounds like you're using the bombs is really effective because you just have it's just like an army of deterrents basically isn't it like, <laughs> yeah the, 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 the bomb is such a big problem and those fucking ballistas at the back just like you don't because you assume i mean you miss 25 percent of the time and then you can reroll scatter as well like you just assume that one of those two ballistas i mean the odds of both of them missing is what one in 16 like it's such a low chance of both of them missing and if one of them hits it just creates such a massive problem like one of like those ballistas by themselves nullified Gulliver, who's what two hundred points. Like yeah. it, they are, they're really powerful, especially in this legion. Yeah, definitely. Um, there are ways to obviously mitigate it by just having dudes nearby that it can scatter onto. Um, but that's what the crossbows are for. Um, yeah. The crossbows are there to just thin out the guys that you can scatter onto. And then I target the guys I actually want to hit with the crossbows. Maybe I get lucky with a six. Maybe I don't. But I'm probably going to hit someone and you're going to have yeah. to come to me where the bomb is. Yeah. And then you go, well, yeah, so, and you're in trouble. Overall, trouble. where did you finish? So I finished uh, 18th. Um, if I'd got my oath, I think I would have jumped five places. Um, wow. But um, so 18th overall, I think there are 140 players at least. Yeah. I'm very happy with that. Um, four wins, one draw, one loss. Uh, my aim coming in was at least four wins, um, which hopefully would have placed me in the top four of the team. Um, so I did better than I'd hoped, um, which is all I can hope for, really. And where did the other three in the top four come then? Um, one of us. Uh, Jay played Jay Clare in the final. So there's a seventh game for the two people who came top um, as like a tiebreaker. Um, he lost that, so he came second. Um, someone came sixth, uh, tenth, and then I came 18th. What lists did the others bring, just out of interest? Uh, great question. You're testing my knowledge here now. Um, <laughs> I can't actually remember what uh, Jay brought. Um, I'll have to have a quick look. So the other lists that, that did quite well in our team were um, Angmar, naturally. Uh, that was Jay, so he came second with Angmar. Uh, we had um, Assault on Lothlorien and oh, okay. also um, Theodred's Guard. So that was Ali, who also came third in the International Masters. Um wow. And apparently he's played that list like over 30 times um, this year and only lost about three games with them. Mm. Um, wow. They look really good. And he used Grimbold, um, you'll be happy to know. Wow, there you oh, go. Oh, what the people Grimbold. want. Yeah, well, I think well, he only had man. about five the, the cows. The best Rohan hero. Yeah. Um, no, that's a cat categorical cool fact. If you're allowed yeah. to run about these things, then... Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't right, have a shall, shall we uh, rank then? And of course, judge, we've been mostly talking about competitive, but of course we're not really ranking our legendary legions purely on their competitive ability. We're looking for what they like to play, what's their theme like, are they fun to play, do they provide something interesting that the regular list doesn't? Um, was this fun to play, Matt? Uh, 100% it was really fun to play. Um, in the singles, I felt in control of the games, obviously being the person that my opponent had to come to. Um, in the doubles, it just didn't work. It wasn't fun to play. Um, but in singles, it, it was really, it was good fun. You think it was fun to play against? Because we know that at least one of your opponents was a little, a little bit salty about... I think it, it can be very devastating... Um, and potentially unfun to play. I think if if the person playing Assault on Helm's Deep is trying really, really hard to win, um, for example, 
in in a fun game, I would just run my bomb in and blow dudes up. But in a game where that's not optimal, I'm not going to do that if I'm trying to win. So um, you can play it in a very fluffy way and you can play it in a very competitive way. Um, and I like that it's first time like that. Yeah, it's a, a good balance. And then I, I guess from a, a fluff perspective, what do we think? Because I think it's designed actually quite well in the... It's taking a very iconic moment from the film, and I guess to a lesser extent from the book, although this is very much the kind of film version, isn't it? And um, it's it's kind of going, well, we don't have any of the named characters, so we need to give it something that means that people will want to play a very themey list that's very you know, suboptimal. Because if before this existed, if you wanted to do this idea, there's no reason really to take an Urukai captain over any of the named captains, is there? No. no. So I think it succeeds very well there, doesn't it? Definitely. It's it's making you take captains, which is obviously not as good as the named captains, um, but you can personalise them with their own little things and Obviously, one of them gets buffed to be, you know, the, the captain on the rock, as it were. Yeah. And then in terms of other rules, I mean, it's mainly focused on that idea of, um, you know, having... It's not really... I don't really want to call it a horde, but you're you're not the most elite. You've got a decent amount of Urukai. And, of course, because you don't have the more expensive characters, you can kind of go to town. But then, as we were talking about multiple threats, you've got the bombs, you've got the the lister. I think you could play this list because the previous episode we were talking about how uh, range of Astilia and you can kind of just sit back and shoot. You could play this like that. I feel like there's a bit more to this than that, though, isn't there? Because not every model has a bow and because you've got that kind of control element to it where you're kind of able to threaten them with the bomb so they don't necessarily want to close but then they do because of the ballista and then you've also got quite strong melee troops that you want to throw in there's maybe a little bit more to work with that maybe makes it a bit more a bit more interesting i would argue than rangers but you might disagree rangers has more interesting heroes i guess um yeah but they don't have uh, other interesting elements like the bomb or the siege siege weapons yeah um I didn't play aggressively enough in my games. Uh, I was told by at least two opponents um, I should have just ran forward. I really wanted to use the ranged power of my list, um, but I didn't need to, and it was actually detrimental to do that in a couple of the games. So, um, notably, the game I lost and the game I drew in. So, um, arguably, while it has that range threat, you're often better off not using it. Whereas yeah. I feel like the, the bows of Lothlorien is really much, we have one gimmick and that's it. Whereas this yeah. has, this has at least two or three gimmicks. And, and the ballista do get a lot of attention, don't they? But in a way it's almost kind of um, under representing this list, just to think of it as the ballista list. There, there is a bit more going on, isn't there? Yeah. I think the way that some people use it, 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 it is just the ballista list. But um, I honestly think the bomb is just so good. Um, there's another list that had uh, no bomb, but just more dudes with lots of pikes, um, which was a lot less entertaining to watch um, <laughs> from what I heard. But um, lots of people seem to enjoy the bomb going off. So it, There's an element of kind of, not really spectacle, but it, because it isn't guaranteed, there's always that kind of element of it might not work, it might be the dud. Yeah, and it's fun. It's it's different. It's random. Yeah, um, it's uh, a dude um, blow himself up to kill opponents. Absolutely. If if someone's starting off then and they want to collect this, what are they going to need to buy? I mean, first of all, you're going to need to get your hands on an Urukai captain, and from there, we're probably looking at you want to buy. A ballista for the low points to start off with, and a box of the plastic Urukai warriors, some of the crossbows, and then that's probably enough to start off with if you're looking at kind of a 400 point, isn't it? 
it's only at the larger points that you're starting to look at multiple ballista, bringing in the bombs, bring in kind of more elements to the list. Yeah, and I think like looking at so for instance, I used I used the mayor's list when I was like looking at how much a four hundred and a six fifty point list would cost. Um and like the the Uruguay warriors are fine, you can get hold of captains, not too expensive, but like those ballistas, I mean, they're sold out right now because I don't know, maybe maybe the hype's already built up from the mayor's performance at um, Arlecon, <laughs> but um, <laughs> they, they've but, been performing well for a while, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I mean, the, the, the ballistas are twenty eight quid each, I think, um, and like suddenly, if you're putting multiple in the army, it's already you know fifty plus yeah. quid for for two ballistas, which is a lot. But like. Yeah, the the, the Uruk Warriors being plastic is nice, and actually they're relatively elite, so you get good good points for the money you're spending. I think probably, the crossbow is kind of... probably worth having a look on eBay for the Warriors as well, just because mm. I think Isengard is very popular. Yeah. So you probably are going to have quite a lot of them floating around. So it's probably not the cheapest one to get into, just because you are having to buy some of that extra stuff. But then equally, all you really need to run a lot of other different variety of Isengard lists is, you know, a, a few characters and you can run different kinds of lists. So if you want to get into Isengard, it's, an, it's one that you can do fairly easily. But, like, are you going to take multiple ballistas in any other Isengard list? No. no, no. So, so, so you are like, you I are going to take crossbows. You are going to probably take warriors yeah, unless you go like, down the scout route. But the ballistas, a, a ballista is more expensive than the entire box of Urukai warriors. True. Yeah. Um, I would say that if you're on a budget and you want to play assault and helms deep, just get warriors, captains, and some bombs. Yeah, um, and, and the bombs probably... do come in a plastic kit, and they are actually. Not They're fairly well priced. priced. Yeah. You get you get two in a box. I want to say the box is around twenty pounds. And what you could do is you get way more um, of the little siege engineers than you need for the bombs. So you could just give slap a shield on them. Mm. Yeah, the I think there's, 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 definitely, there's, some yeah. there's definite capacity for converting things here, like because. A lot of Urukai, and this is going to sound a bit racist, but a lot of the Urukai do <laughs> fairly similar. Like, <laughs> this, this is gross or crazy. We're going to we're gonna have to beef this out of the podcast now. You, you can, like, do some conversions and things like that. So that that's definitely... I think, I think what we'll do now is I'll just no context put a beef in after. <laughs> so said this is going to sound a bit racist. <laughs> just just cut all this out. Yeah, just cut it all out. Yeah. 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 Um, Not going to happen because I, I'll be too lazy. So it would have been good. Um, <laughs> one thing, one thing I will say, uh, having like, um, I've actually put some of the costs into a spreadsheet now uh, to keep track of. Them. Of course, yeah. Um, yeah. The assault on Helm's Deep is like above average in terms of the amount of money you have to spend um, for a four hundred and a six fifty point list if, if you want to run it. Yeah, if you're including the ballistas, like. Again, we we mentioned this last time. So much of like keeping costs down is building a list that works around the boxes. And like the problem with say mounted heroes or like a standalone unit like the ballista is you're not getting as much value from like a box where you can build like. So, for instance, one of the cheapest legions I've looked at is um, Return of the King because the Army of the Dead is a plastic um plastic box and like you can build pretty much a whole army from just that one box whereas say with rides of theoden or this legion you do need the extra stuff to make it sort of fully viable so it is just something to consider but yeah definitely i, I think the, like what you two have said about the theme of the legion i think it's really cool um again like just just the way the rules are designed i think it does push you towards almost replicating the scene from the movies like the Isengard yeah. hordes encourages you to take ballistas, which normally you you may maybe won't. Um, and yeah, you get you get the captain on the rock, which is cool, and no named heroes. So I think, as you two have said, it, it does the job really well of recreating that scene from the films, the book. Overall, then, 
tier wise so our four tiers fantastic at the top then we got solid average and then at the bottom with i i'm gonna go ahead and say that despite the fact that it gets a little bit of that kind of rep of it's the kind of you're, you're taking it to win i don't think it has to be that and i think that actually i don't think it is as also win as somebody who first looks at it might think the blisters probably are a little bit underpointed it's definitely very good value but like the mayor was saying if you're not actually thinking very carefully about you know who you're shooting at making sure that you're using crossbows first to remove models the scatter dice from the blisters are gonna have an impact if people against you are playing well it's not an auto win i i think this is a fantastic i think that this is really well designed it's fluffy it makes you do something different with the eyes and guard list but still works out really well you guys in agreement no oh okay <laughs> okay i see um, where would you put it there um I think I think what you've you said is exactly right. Um, I think they just need to change the ballistas. Uh, I don't think increasing the points is correct, though. I think the problem with well, increasing they, they the have they have brought yeah. in the FAQ to mean that there's a range, and we I think we're all in agreement that it's a bit weird in the rules that there isn't a firing arc. But I don't um, necessarily think that that is like it breaks the game. Um, but so I don't think you should increase the points of the ballistas because then I think that incentivizes, um, I think that means you're less likely to run them outside of this. So I don't think that's what you want to do. I think mm -hmm. like I'm suggesting something really quite minor. I would just remove one of the re-rolls either to hit or on the scatter chart. So like it just makes it slightly less consistent because I think the slight issue with this is it's a bit like Rangers of Athelion, where if you're playing somebody who is taking it very seriously, like it can just feel not very fun to interact with. And like, I would argue it's too consistent in terms of it always hitting. So I think just to try and make it a little bit less of like consistent shooting and just up the variance a bit, I would remove one of the re-rolls. But what I would say is I don't think this Legion is too strong. I just think I'd rather the shooting was maybe slightly less good and then maybe like the combat was slightly more good. So one thing, yeah. I, did think, one thing I did think that would be quite themey was you could try and buff the berserkers perhaps slightly. Yes. Because one, one of yes. one of the things one of the things I <laughs> I really recall from um, the siege at Helm's Deep is when that berserker jumps over the wall and like fucking swings. You see, and takes like, a bunch of eyes. I completely, no <laughs> I completely disagree with this because I think the circus are already good enough and that you're just increasing something that doesn't need the buff. Like the ish the issue with taking this legion if it didn't exist is that you don't have any like really good heroes and it would just be like a blob of Isengard if you didn't focus on the ballistas and the bombs. I, I accept that maybe you could remove a reroll. I feel like if you're going to remove a reroll from the blister, you should put something into the demo teams in the special rules. There, there is. Is there? Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. What yeah. is the demo team thing then? Is that a reroll as well? Two dice rather than one, so it's better than a reroll. Yeah. Okay, I, I guess I guess you could. Hmm. You see, to so, me, everything you've just talked about there is not an issue of the Legion. It's that people need just to put more terrain down on their board. I think I, I will say there, there, there was quite a lot of terrain at Articon, um, yeah. and it was quite mitigating, um, especially in games. I mean, there was a lot of solid terrain. Uh, it did yeah. make a big difference. Um, and I, I think that's all you need. That's all you need. You just need to make sure that when you're placing terrain, you don't leave like a hill where the Isengard are going to deploy and a massive empty area so that it's impossible to approach them. Just make sure that there's like the person with the blisters actually will have to think a little bit about where they're deploying and like where they can fire and like corridors of fire. That's all you need and it would be interesting. It's fine. I think I really like the Berserker idea. Yeah. Um, I think you're probably right about the ballistas in that it's a little bit too tempting to take a lot of them and that seems to be what the more 
competitive players are doing, which says to me, maybe they're a little bit too strong here. I think a firing arc to avoid the cheese, plus um, potentially not re-rolling all the scatter, or maybe just being a three plus to hit instead of re-rolling, um, which I think is slightly worse yeah. than re-rolling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Having said that, it does mean that um, obviously you've got a mite on the veteran, so you can mitigate that a little bit. Um, but the six inch minimum range was um, to avoid the cheese of shooting someone who's in base contact with you, as opposed to nerfing them particularly. Um, so, but that that is a nerf, isn't it? It is a little nerf, um, but I, I'd say it's more to avoid the the cheesiness yeah. of it than flat out making them worse. Um, uh, so I, I think I would happily trade trade the ballista thing for a little berserker buff, whatever that is. Maybe they get a five plus on their field no pain rather than six plus. Um, and uh, I feel like any six or something. Any save in this game should not be very good. You don't see t people taking berserkers with this legion. I will say that. That's that's so that's yeah. why I, I that's why I picked it because I looked at your list and clearly it, it's good because it's done well. Um, but like you didn't take berserkers, and so no. I, I was saying like not not a general buff to berserkers. I think they're fine, but specifically in this legion because of what happened at the siege. Yeah. Like I was wondering if you give them like a buff of plus one fight if they're outnumbered or just like oh, that would one, be nice. or like like plus one strength if you really wanted to push it but like i i think this lead i don't think this legion's overpowered this is sounding like i'm fashion legion but like i think just a little shift away from away from the range the, away yeah. from the ballistas to like and the reason i picked the berserkers was because you didn't put them in your list and i think it would be quite themey so yeah i agree i i I like I think, the Berserkers. I they're, my, they're, they're one of my favourite units in the game. Um, I didn't take any, even though I love the fact they encourage seven and they can deal with um, you know, tagging trolls and stuff. But yeah. um, people just tend to try and max out crossbows. Um, yeah. And the bomb is like a, I need a bomb, so I'm just going to have one. And I'm just going to take it's as many dudes. It's not true that you didn't have any Berserkers. You had one. With the I did team. have one with the Dennis team, yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Incidentally, <laughs> yeah, um, I did take a spare berserker in the doubles list, though. Um, it did prove useful uh, in a couple of scenarios where I needed to try and bomb something that caused terror, like Shelob. So if I, I won the move off, and we needed to, to tag Shelob, I could with the berserker, obviously, yeah. which causes terror, um, and then I can position the bomb. Whereas if I had normal dudes. <laughs> I'd be desperately trying to do it. So I think um, the Berserkers, the, a little Berserker buff, and I love all of your suggestions, um, and I want all of them simultaneously as well. Yeah, there we go. Right, OT, if it's not fantastic, what, what tier did you have oh, I mean, I mean, it, it, with, with my change, and this would be fantastic, but like I, the, the only two criticisms I have of this... We, without are, the change, though, as it is. Where without, is it without the change. Uh, so my criticisms are, I think the blisters are just... I think they're slightly too consistent, and I think that's a problem. And then I think the Legion is just a little bit expensive if you want to run it optimally. Um, mm. That So I think it... it I think it's quite harsh. I'd put it right at the top of solid, but like if you do want to put it in fantastic, I can see that because... I it, think as, it's as really player, good as the player of this legion. Then, Mayor, you get the casting vote. Solid or fantastic? Um, I'm afraid it is fantastic. Um, yeah. I think when I first got this book, I was desperate for there to be a Isengard legion that I really wanted to take. And honestly, I wasn't that impressed with any of them. I liked Uglug Scouts, but. Um, I didn't have any scouts at the time and I didn't particularly want to repaint any. Um, and uh, the other legions involved too much uh, of taking stuff. I could have taken Assault and Helm's Deep straight away, but I didn't because I didn't think it looked particularly strong. Now I think I was an idiot. Um, it's obviously <laughs> very strong. Um, it's You yeah. can play it, Themy. You could, um, at low points, um, uh, have it with just bombs and dudes. Um and I think anyone who has an Isengard Force um, could could play this Legion um, without too much hassle. It can be played competitively. It can be played in just a fun, I'm going to take dudes with a Shaman to make my guys, my guys fearless and like five bombs. Like, 
Like that would be hilarious. Um, <laughs> I, and one day yeah. I'm going to do that <laughs> for sure. I look forward to that day. So that's our first entry into Fantastic as a legendary yeah. legion. I'm sure it won't be the only one to reach those dizzying heights. I think yeah. then that's it. So I think a, a huge congratulations to the mayor on a fantastic article. Thank you. And thank you for your um, cheerleading through the tournament. Yeah. We couldn't yeah, offer any actual, any actual advice. We were just no. there. <laughs> I should have sent you pictures for the games. Very much just asking what was happening and yeah. Yeah. just sort of not really adding anything. But there you go. That's, what the we, that's, what we that's a bit like the podcast. Yeah, we are very much just here. As <laughs> but anyway there you go right i think we're going to end it there thank you very much for listening if you have been if you want to ask any questions about the mayor's list feel free to contact us information is in the description but i think bye for me bye guys take care bye we will see you next week